All right, so we're almost done with the hard work, people. We have one last lecture with new learning material, and then the rest is easy. We have uh, a lecture that I'm gonna just do a bunch of examples. Uh, I'm gonna try to do one of each of the major uh, elements that we've, um, we've talked about. Um, then we're going to do beam testing, which you guys are just gonna watch Dave and I test a bunch of beams. Normally we'd have you guys interact and talk to us while we go through it and we'd make predictions. So we'll have awkward pauses while you guys guess what happens. And then the last lecture will be a lecture of your choosing that me or Dave or both of us will give together um, about one of the kind of various topics we've done throughout the years. So this is the last day of new stuff. And you would think it would be intimidating because it's the concrete columns and beams lecture. Here's the thing. They have really good charts and tables for designing um, concrete columns. And you can get very in depth with some of these things, but we are trying to keep it to the kind of very, very easy stage of sizing these things. So our columns and beams examples are not going to be that complicated. The, the beam one, it looks rather intimidating, but when you actually go through the process, it's a very simple process uh, to kind of verify some of our information. The hardest part about designing with concrete is that you often have to make a bunch of assumptions, go through your design, see if it was right, and then you might have to make minor tweaks and go through the process again. So sometimes you have to go through it two or three times, but you're getting closer and closer to the right answer each time. So let's start by introducing reinforced concrete. You've heard me talk about the fact that it is a, a composite material, which means it needs to be bonded or uh, connected for longitudinal shear. Um, and the parts of reinforced concrete that do different jobs um, behave in slightly different ways. So in compression, concrete and steel both share the work. We looked at an example like that last week that wasn't a full in-depth example for a reinforced concrete column, but we'll do one this week. But we saw that there is some sharing of the load based on stiffness uh, between the steel and the concrete. So there's varying area and varying stiffness, and it's kind of a combination of those two things that defines the overall stiffness of each material. Tension, steel rebar does tensile work. So concrete, we consider it has like zero tensile capacity. Um, shear, we will use concrete or concrete plus steel to do the work. So columns, compression. Something in bending, we know that the top is in compression and the bottom is in tension. So for uh, something in bending, we have the concrete at the top. Sometimes we'll make use of steel at the top in the compression zone, but usually we use the concrete. And then at the bottom, we only make use of reinforcing at the bottom to do the tensile work. And then shear, remember that's that act of slipping past each other when something's in bending, uh, is shear. If we can do the quick check and it works with just concrete, we don't go any further. But if we need to, we can use steel in there as well. Um, we also will use reinforcing in our concrete um, in a non-structural way, or these are just some things to think about when we're talking about reinforced concrete. We will put shrinkage reinforcement in it. Uh, concrete shrinks, what is it over, like? 0.1%. Yeah, 0.1%. So, like, over a one meter length, I mean, it has to do with area as well, so it's a little bit more complicated than that. But you will get a certain amount of, um, of shrinkage cracking in your element. So it shrinks, which means there has to be a gap somewhere, and you'll get a certain amount. You could have, over that one meter, one large crack. What we do with shrinkage reinforcement is we place some reinforcing in there so that you still get that total summation of cracking. It just spreads it out in a bunch of small cracks along the length of the element. 
This is a thing you need to get your head around. Concrete shrinks, concrete cracks. Concrete will 100% crack. You will see cracks in concrete. You can't make it go away. You can do some very expensive things to have very minimal cracking, but normal reinforced concrete will definitely have visible cracking. Probably one of the calls I get the most is this retaining wall is cracking, uh, the owner's really upset, what's going on? And the answer is concrete cracks. Probably, I've said that deflection, uh, like cracking of drywall finishes was probably the number one lawsuits that you see happen. Um, probably number two is cracking in concrete, eh? Frivolous claims for, for cracking of concrete. Um, because clients don't understand that the cracks are structurally sound, that that is okay. Um, so as the design team, and you, we don't really get to talk to the client, you guys as the architect do probably 99% of the face-to-face uh, -face interactions with the client. You need to make it clear to them that concrete cracks. Just say it as a mantra. Okay, well, we're gonna do a refurbished concrete wall, so you know you'll see some cracks, but we'll design it so that it's structurally sound. Just make sure the client understands that concrete will crack. We do lots of things to try to help control the cracking. So we'll put the reinforcing in. We'll make cuts over, like, so say it was, um, we know we get cracks roughly every three meters. Well, we will saw cut on a three meter by three meter grid, hoping that when the cracks happen, because they will happen, they will happen there where there was a little bit less concrete so that the, con the crack will form along that saw cut line that we put in. Doesn't always, but that's the goal. So we try to lead the concrete to crack in somewhat of a pleasing manner. Sidewalks, they'll pour what looks like one or like four small panels. That's really one long panel that they put crack controls in. Um, so there's expansion joints and crack control controls in your sidewalk. My three-year-old and two-year-old during COVID obsessed with walking down the street and at every line on the sidewalk they'd be like what's that and they'd make me tell them if it was an expansion joint or um, a crack joint um, it was a very slow walk and we would do that every day for months um, but take a look next time and you'll see the difference it's just where they make a line in it and you can still see concrete at the bottom of it hoping that that's where the the concrete will crack it doesn't always though so you gotta prepare everyone for that. The other thing that's not, well, it's, it's structural, but it's not really, it's the cover. Um, so remember, concrete behaves really well in fire. Steel, eh, not so much. We lose strength in, when we expose steel to fire. Concrete can insulate our steel for us. So remember, if we've got bottom steel doing all the work for tension in our bending element, or we've got steel doing work as a column, if there was a fire, we need to know that that steel is protected. So we will designate a certain amount of concrete around the steel to be fire protection. We'll also use cover to protect the steel from the elements. So if we're casting concrete right on the soil, so the bottom of a footing, for example, will want a little more cover because the moisture can wick up through and cause that steel to rust. So we'll give a little bit extra room to the first piece of steel there. So this gets called up on the structural drawings, but the fire protection is very important for the coordination between the architect and the engineer because you guys know the fire rating. So you have to let us know what the fire rating is um, because if it's say a three hour fire rating, which is a pretty extreme fire rating, it changes the amount of cover we need to our reinforcing elements or how far away from the edge of the concrete we have to be at least to protect our steel from fire. So concrete itself, the actual mix, is um, a composite material. And it is a mix of aggregate. So we have coarse aggregates. So those would be like your small rocks. We have fine aggregate, which is more like your sand. We have a little bit of air, depending, water, 
and cement. So this would be Portland cement. Um, and these all get mixed together. Um, there's different mixes. The mix actually gets designed by the concrete plant. But the structural engineer designates what type of mix they actually need. Because in different environments, we want different things out of our concrete. So depending on uh, what it is, we'll put entrained air in. So those are little bubbles that we'll put in it. Um, we can add other things to the concrete, but again, add mixtures, which would maybe make it flow easier or have a faster cure. Those would come from, those would come from the plant themselves. So uh, they would clarify with the engineer, but they'd be the ones designating the percentages and the amounts of those things in their mix. Um, for example, Fast Cure one, um, I'm doing a project that they were casting concrete a couple weeks ago when it was really, 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 really cold. You have to protect concrete in the cold. Um, below, you're not allowed to pour below minus five unless it's fully heated. Um, and below like five degrees, you have to start doing things to try to keep the, the, the concrete protected while it's curing. Um, they, it's very expensive to heat under tarps. You can imagine when it's minus 20, trying to heat under the tarps, um, usually for about seven days until they get to their seven day strength. Um, so what the client or what the, co what the contractor did was request from the, uh, the, the, uh, the concrete plant um, an ad mixture that would have it cure faster so that it would hit its seven day strength in two or three days so that they only needed to heat the concrete for two or three days rather than the full seven days. So they saved a ton of money on propane heaters, for example. So here's just an example of a concrete mix. Again, you guys don't need to know much about this. Um, they will, while the concrete is being cast, cast a few cylinders. So they're about that big. Um, three or four of each truck, essentially as they're pouring it out. Um, and then they take those back to the plant and they sit there and they will test one at seven days to see if the strength is what they expect it to be. And then they'll test it again at 28 days. And if it's maybe not quite what they expected it to be, they'll test another one at 56 days to ensure that the concrete that's there in the field is as strong as what we called up for. Now, Steel and wood is a little bit easier. We know the strength of our material before it even gets to site. Concrete, they're making it on the day and it's not a hope and a prayer that it's strong enough because it's rarely not strong enough, but it is sometimes we don't get the concrete strength we need. So what do you do when you don't get the concrete strength you need? You, do, you go back and at seven days you test it and it's really below where it should be. And at 28 days, it's still not there. And then you hold out and at 56 days, they test the last cylinder and it's still not where it needed to be. So say we needed 32 MPA concrete and it's only at 28. Do we tell them to dig up all the concrete or take down the columns and redo it? We try really hard not to. So what we'll do is go back and really refine those calculations. So maybe uh, there was 50 columns all designed the same, and this concrete was used on 10 of them. Maybe we get lucky and those 10 weren't kind of the worst case of the set. Maybe they were ones at the corner that had slightly less tributary area. And we will go back and we'll build the contractor for this because this is part of their scope. Um, and kind of really sharpen our pencil and see if we can really clarify uh, those loads on those specific ones to get it to, to work with only a 28 day or a 28 MPA concrete, for example. That's just an example. Um, so tearing up or breaking down the concrete would very much be a last resort. Um, I don't think I've ever had to do it on a project. Um, you must have. You must have had them have to tear out some concrete. I never have. No, you haven't either. I know Blackwell as a whole has. Yeah, Ian has on, on uh, Lakefield. Yeah. And well, so I worked on Lakefield too. That's right. Yeah. The I water that house. 
Um, so it can happen, but we don't want that to happen because it's not work for us. We're busy. We don't want to have to have it get torn out because it's a whole thing all of a sudden. So we will do what we can to make sure that doesn't happen. So here are some individual stress strain curves of the materials. So this is the concrete by itself. So concrete really only works in compression. So here's what the curve looks like. Steel, this is our rebar, that looks very much like our steel curve with 40 MPa. Look at this, look at what our reduction factor is for rebar. Instead of being 0.9, we have 0.85 for reinforcing steel. Concrete, we use 0.65. So even though we know we have 25 MPa concrete, we will say we're only taking 65% of that strength. We're only going to assume we get 65% of that strength. So there's some buffers in there too. Here is the full stress strain curve for concrete. So here we go, we go up, we get our peak compressive stress. Here's our E or our modulus of elasticity. And then here is the tension zone. We say that effectively, this is zero. We don't even make use of it. We ignore this completely. We cut it out of our curve completely. And we only rely on the compressive strength of concrete. We call the compressive strength, the maximum compressive strength of concrete, uh, F prime C. So you remember for steel, it was Fy. Uh, for wood, depending on if it was bending, compression, or shear, it was F. C, F, B, or F, V. Well, for concrete, we do F prime C. So here we go. Here are some concrete properties. Now again, like wood, we have various different um, types. So wood, we're picking what one we want. With concrete, we're making different ones. So F prime C, uh, can vary between 20 and 40 MPa. You can actually have concrete, um, there's a concrete mix called lean mix, which is around 1.5 MPa. Um, there's some kind of grades of it that we might use as 5 MPa. But most reinforced concrete is going to be between 25 and 40. Most things are still even 25 or 30 MPa. E is a little bit different than our other materials. It is related to F prime C. There is a relationship between those two things. So a, a higher grade concrete will actually have a higher E value to it um, because the mix is actually changing the stiffness of the material as well. Uh, but I'm going to tell you that it ranges between 14,000 and 41,000 MPa. Again, this is a rough approximation, but somewhere around 30 MPa is going to be something reasonable for our E. Now, when I'm doing this, I have calculations to figure out what E is based on the F prime C. Our reduction factor, 0.65 or 65% of our F prime C. So remember, compressive strength between 20 and 40 MPa, tensile strength, almost zero. We will assume zero. Concrete has a little bit of flexural strength, but we don't really make use of it. Um, we rely on the compressive zone of our concrete and ignore that there's any flexural strength in it. So what different grades of concrete do we use? What different F prime C's? Well, depending on the role, we'll give it different classifications. Remember, the higher the strength, the more expensive the concrete is. So if there are things that um, kind of just are about brute area, maybe we don't need it to be quite as strong. So footings and caissons are usually all about the bearing of the soil and the strength of the concrete is slightly less relevant. So we'll use 20 MPa concrete. Foundation walls and slabs on grade are usually 25 MPa unless they're exposed to de-icing chemicals and then they'd be 32 MPa. Framed slabs and columns, 30 MPa. If we're doing mid-rise, we might bump that up. And if we're doing high-rises to kind of keep our cross-sectional area down, we'll really bump it up because there, there starts to be value in using the more expensive concrete 
to reduce our area that's taking up floor space, which is money. That was the worst cha-ching ever. Uh, but it's taking up floor space from the client, so we'll increase the strength of the concrete because there's actually a payoff to do it there. On our low rise, there's actually no cost value in using the stronger concrete. So that was the concrete. Let's talk about the rebar now. Um, so we use an FY. So remember our normal steel, we had an FY of 350 MPA. Rebar is actually a little bit higher. It's the same E, 200,000 MPA, but our FY we use 400 MPA. Um, rebar, I should have a picture of rebar in here. Let's, I'm going to bring this over here and let's, let's Google an image of rebar. All right, so here you can see that rebar has all of these kind of funny little variegations on it. Well, some of it is the way they make it. So they actually, um, uh, it's forged. So they heat it up and they press it in a mold. And you can see where it comes out of the mold here. You can see the line here on the edge where they open it back up and some of the steel is kind of squeezed out the side. Imagine, um, if you've ever worked with Play-Doh, for example, and you squeeze it in between two molds, you get a little bit kind of pop out around the sides. These bumps, though, those are how we bond with our concrete. That's how we ensure that we have that longitudinal shear transfer so that our rebar doesn't just slip within our concrete. You make it bumpy and it can't slip along the concrete. Um, so we have different sizes of rebar. We call them in Canada M, which is a nominal representation of what the diameter is. So 10M, 15M, 20M, all the way up to 55M. Now, 10M bars are really, really, really floppy. We don't like to do them on a grid on the ground because inevitably, if you're doing a slab, you're walking around on them. It's really hard to step in between them without getting your foot caught. So it's easier to walk on the bars. 10 M bars will bend if you step on them. So we tend to only use them for shear reinforcing and crack control elements. Uh, we'll space bars between 2.5 times the diameter. So that's as low as we go because we need enough room for concrete to get down in between the bars. And we'll space them up to about 500 millimeters apart, or three times the slab or wall thickness. Usually, a good rule of thumb is the fewer large bars is the cheapest way to go. But smaller bars work better. So how do you balance that? Sometimes you have to play around with it and try it one way, see how it looks, What's your, what rebar do you get, does it look reasonable? And if not, you might have to try the other extreme. And sometimes it might end up somewhere in between. I'm experienced at this. I know what looks normal now. Um, you less so. The way we're going to design our problems that we have coming up, I will give you a cross section and tell you to calculate values for it. So you're not going to have to make that starting guess that I would normally have to make. But literally, we draw a section we draw what we want, and then we calculate it to see if it's strong enough for us. And if it's not, we have to make adjustments and go back and do it again. So we start with an answer and then check to see if our answer works. And sometimes it takes a few iterations. For our strength work, the stuff that's the heavy hitting, so not, not the shear reinforcing and the crack control, uh, 15M, 20M, and 25M bars are the most common ones we work with. Uh, 45 and 55 M's are available, but they're really expensive and are a last resort. So what we do with rebar, um, if we have it in concrete and we take, and they're cast into the concrete and we have this piece of rebar because they come in like 10 meter lengths, I think it's about as long as they come, right? Sounds about right. Yeah. 
Um, so we have this piece of rebar and this piece of rebar, and our wall is 20 meters long. So you put 10 meters and 10 meters like this. Well, what happens at that joint? You have nothing crossing that joint. So you can imagine you need to lap those pieces of rebar like this. And the amount you lap them is what it takes to transfer the load from this piece of rebar into that piece of rebar through the concrete. So that is called development length or a lap length. And there are prescribed values for each bar for how long you have to lap them depending on what the diameter of the bar is. 45 and 55 M bars have to lap each other so much that you essentially have no length room left to work with. Um, so what they do with 45 and 55 M bars is they actually have couplers. So a 45 M bar would have a male joint on it and this 55 M bar would have a female joint on it and they actually lock together. Um, so those are expensive and a last resort. Typically we're going to be working with uh, 15, 20, and 25 M bars as our strength bars and 10 M bars as our shear reinforcing or crack control. So you can see here that the cross-sectional area is calculated based on the diameter. So concrete columns and compression. We saw last week that they share the load. They have some sharing of the load based on their relative stiffness. And that stiffness comes from the modulus elasticity, or the stiffness of the material, and the area, because the more of it you have, the stiffer it is as well. So that combination of um, area to modulus of elasticity as a ratio of the whole indicates what percentage of load each material will take. Steel actually has two roles in compression in, uh, in a concrete column. So the longitudinal shear carries the load. It has to be designed. But we also have ties around it to keep the concrete from essentially bursting uh, before we get our full compressive strength. So that's based on column geometry. So that would come from a list of tables and is somewhat standardized. Here's why reinforcing concrete is so freaking neat. Strain, we know, must be the same. We talked about this last week. Steel and concrete, they're moving together, so the strain has to be the same. Steel is much stiffer than concrete. E is 2,000 or 200,000 MPA, and E is uh, 30,000 MPA. Look, I have that little arrow backwards. So slide 10, I need to change that. The steel stress will be much higher than the concrete stress because they have the same strain. Steel will yield before the concrete reaches its full stress capacity or around a strain of 0.015. But the steel will keep yielding, remember we like yielding because that's ductility, until the concrete finally fails when it reaches a strain of 0.03. So they'll keep um, they'll keep having a strain move together as the load increases. What, ha what this means is we get to make full use of both materials all the way to their complete limit. We get to use the full strength of the steel and we get to use the full strength of the concrete, which is a really neat phenomenon considering one is brittle and one is ductile. So what does the concrete compression calculation look like? Well, we have PR naught. Now, this is just a process where they break it down step by step. The total PR naught, or the compressive resistance, is the compressive resistance of the concrete plus the compressive resistance of the steel. That is exactly what we looked at last week. Um, this means, this O means that we have no eccentricity or that our load is perfectly aligned with our, the center of our column. So PRC is the resistance from our concrete. The PRS is the resistance due to steel. We know that steel, well, let's look at the concrete first. So PRC is alpha one, our reduction factor, F prime C times the area of the concrete. This 
is really just a fancy way of saying what we've said for our other materials. We have our, our, uh, our shape property times our maximum capacity that we can have for our material. Um, alpha is basically a factor we throw in for uneven distribution of concrete. Um, it's usually around 0.8. It varies depending on the capacity of the concrete. We're just going to stick with 0.8 for right now, um, but it's usually somewhere around there. And it is a thing that gets calculated um, for each each kind of um, each batch of con or each ca concrete calculation. Uh, this is the reduction factor for concrete. F prime C is the specified concrete strength or the maximum concrete or the maximum stress our concrete can see. We don't want it to go past that because if it goes past that, we have a brittle failure of our concrete. And then AC is the area of our concrete. So look, this is the same as the other materials that we've talked about, or basically P equals stress times area. So this is, remember, stress equals um, force divided by area. So force equals stress divided by area. If this is the maximum stress we can see, well then that would give us the maximum load we can take. Cross-sectional area is easy. We want um, to make sure we're reducing this capacity. So we apply a reduction factor, and then they add another factor in here just about the unevenness of the concrete. So that's our concrete component. Our steel component is the same as all of the other ones. We have the maximum stress our steel can see times the cross-sectional area of our steel, or the shape property, with a reduction factor. So that is easy. We've done this. You know, this we've done when we were talking about um, regular steel instead of uh, reinforcing steel. Those two things added together is our PR naught. And then we say, you know what? Concrete columns are big and there's a chance our load isn't perfectly in the middle. We could have a little bit of eccentricity. So what does that mean? This is the cross-sectional area of our column and this is our, our column here, we're assuming our load is kind of perfectly on it like this. Well, what if our load is just a little bit off of it? it? Causes a little bit of eccentricity. It's not moving through the centroid of our column. So we say, you know what, ballpark, let's take 80% of the capacity. Let's just assume there's some eccentricity and only take 80% of our capacity. And that's it. We figure out the capacity of the concrete, we figure out the capacity of the steel, add them up and take 80% of it. And that is the capacity of our concrete column. Now, we could write the steel as a ratio of the concrete um, and steel area. Remember that, um, that um, transformed section thing we talked about? Well, we will often transform the section just to make things a little bit easier. Now you're going to say, I see that equation. That does not look easier to me. Except that this allows us to build some handy charts so that we can look things up. So we're going to call this ratio uh, rho, where we have the area of the seal divided by the gross area. Our new, ex our new compression equation, by making use of this, we have our gross area times our uh, our, um, our row factor uh, times the air, our reduction factor for seal times our Fy for seal plus 1 minus the row factor times our alpha times our reduction factor for concrete and our F prime C for concrete. And then again, 80% of that. So this is going to allow us to make use of some handy tables. It's still the same equation where we're actually inputting uh, a ratio in into the equation. Now, remember for steel, we were very worried about, um, uh, well actually no, we were very, 
Do you remember for steel, we talked about our K factor, and we said that we would always use a K of 1, where we allowed rotation at the top and the bottom. But we saw that if we moment connected the top, we actually got a different shape. So if we held it so that these couldn't rotate at the top and the bottom, and we did this, we got a different effective length. But it would mean we had moment at the top and bottom of our columns. And the easy way to detail steel is to not have moment at the top. So we rarely design for moment in our columns because it takes extra work to make it happen. We need more steel. It becomes a more complicated calculation. So we don't. We can, but we don't do it very often. Concrete is a kind of a bigger thing and we make form work and we cast it all as one thing. So we don't get that discrete singular connection. They are inherently moment connected, top and bottom. So that adds some complexity to our calculation. It, it can, can be, be a really good, good thing because, because look, we have actually um, changed the shape of the deformation and we build in a little bit of extra capacity into it. But we have to change the way we do our calculations. Now, that's way beyond the scope of this class. But we have tables where we can find the appropriate reinforcement ratio depending on how much moment our column is taking at the top and bottom and what the compressive load on it is. So if we know what our compressive load is and we know what our moment is at the ends, we can figure out the appropriate reinforcement ratio. And if we have our appropriate reinforcement ratio, we can back out and start to figure out what we need. So here is what one of these handy tables look at, look like. I know, it is a messy, messy looking table. But don't get freaked out. Here are the things we need from this table. It tells us what capacity steel or what capacity concrete we're assuming this table is for. This one happens to be F prime C of 30 MPa. <clears throat> this gamma is 0.7. Gamma is the ratio of the overall dimension to the dimension of the reinforcing. We're basically how much cover do we have? This is related to what our cover is because you can see gamma is our gamma H is this distance and H is this distance. We can calculate what gamma is. We have steel with 400 MPa. It tells us that this table is for a column with equal reinforcement on four sides. So this side has the same amount of bars as this side, has the same amount of bars as this side, has the same amount of bars as this side. There are different row values. You can see this is row right here. And there's different lines depending on what that reinforcing ratio is. This side is PR over AG, or the compressive resistance we need divided by the gross area. This is the moment resistance we need divided by the gross area times H, which is our dimension here. We find these locations, see where it crosses, and then we can pick out what reinforcement ratio we need for our column. That looked crazy. I get it. It looks really overwhelming. It's actually a really simple calculation. It's maybe one of the easiest ones we're going to do. So I think the best way to do it is to actually go through and do a calculation. So we're going, we want to know how much reinforcing we need for a 350 by 350 column with PF equals 2000 kilonewtons and MF equals 150 kilonewtons, kilonewton meters. <coughs> we're going to say the concrete strength is 30 MPa. The reinforcement should be re equal on all sides, and we want to determine the longitudinal reinforcing if we assume 30 millimeters of cover, 10 m ties, and 25 m longitudinal bars. Now, how the hell did I get all of that stuff? Well, let's stop and think where all of these things come from. PF comes from the tributary area. 
we would figure that out. MF, we know, comes from the connection um, of those two joints. We would have done method of sections and tracked our loads through that told us what MF was at the top or bottom or somewhere in the middle of our column. So this would come from our, uh, our load analysis, what we did in structures one. 35 or 350 by 350 column, eh, we're throwing it out there. We don't know. This is what we're going to check or part of what we're going to check. But whatever this project is, somebody has looked at it and said, you know what? 350 by 350 looks like what we're used to seeing for whatever this building type is. Let's try it and see if this works. So this is where a little bit of iteration actually comes into play sometimes. So we're drawing what we think works, and then we're going to check and see what reinforcing to make that makes that work. If everything looks ridiculous in the end, or we need a ridiculous amount of reinforcing, well, maybe this wasn't a good choice for our column size. But we're going to start there. Concrete strength is 30 MPA. Well, do you remember in those slides where I said what a typical concrete strength is for different types of uh, elements we build? For a low-rise column, 30 MPA was pretty normal. So that came out of the fact that we know we're doing some sort of low-rise concrete column right now. The reinforcement should be equal on sides. Well, I think that, if you're making a square element, kind of makes sense. Um, 30 millimeters cover that would come from the fire rating. So we would be looking up in a list what the cover needs to be. I'm going to tell you that. I'm not, I'm not going to make you figure that out. I will tell you what cover you need. So you, as the architect, might have said, well, we have 45 minutes of fire rating that we need. Well, I would go to a table and I would look and say, well, for a concrete column in a building with 45 minutes of fire rating required, I would use 30 millimeters of cover. That means I need 30 millimeters to my very first bit of steel. So I need from here to the outside of this piece of steel, 30 millimeters. And then this piece of steel is a 10 M tie. Remember, that's the thing that stops our concrete from bursting open, but it also is crack control for us. So we need to know that that's what that di diameter is because we want to know what the distance from this, the middle of this piece of rebar to the middle of this piece of rebar is. And we're taking a guess with 25M longitudinal rebar here. So we're guessing the 350 by 350 and the 25M longitudinal bars. Hey. Hey. You made me a copy? Yeah, I got a call. Ah, we need nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I waited too long to ask. Um, so we do need to know what the dimensions of these elements are. Well, a 10 M bar is 10 millimeters wide and a 25 M bar is about 25 millimeters wide. The only thing we're guessing here is the 350 by 350 and the 25 M. Everything else comes out of the fact that that's pretty standard construction methods. So we're going to do this calculation now. So let's start by drawing this beam. I know we have it right there on the image, but I find it always handy in my notes to design my beam or to draw my beam. Actually, I'm going to write out that we know that PF equals 2000 kilonewtons and MF equals 150 kilonewton meters. So somebody else has done that part of the design and given us these loads. And now we need to know if this column or what reinforcing we need for this column is strong enough to work. And they said we had a 350 by 350. So 100, 200, oh, that's too big. I'm going to draw it like this. So this is 350 by 350. We know that we have 30 millimeters of cover before we have our ties. I'm going to draw our ties in. Okay. 
just so you guys can really see what's going on here. So there's our ties, but they have some dimension. They're thick, right? They've got a thickness of 10M. And then we have our reinforcing. We don't know um, how many bars, but we know that there's going to be 25, they're going to be 25 M's. We're going to start with the assumption that they're 25 M bars. And they're going to be uh, equal on all sides. <clears throat> so I'm just going to draw the corner ones for right now, because we know those would be there for sure. <clears throat> So we know that there was 30 millimeters of cover, I think is what they said. Yeah, 30 millimeters of cover. And then 10M bar, so 10 millimeters of diameter. And we also have 25M bar, and then we have the same thing here. So 30, 10, and 25. We know that F prime C equals 30 MPA. That's just a really good strength to use for uh, a concrete column. So B is 350 millimeters. So that's that dimension right there. And H 350 millimeters. That's that dimension right there. Cover, I'm just rewriting all of this right here. The ties were 10 M and the bars were 25 M. So <clears throat> we know that in this calculation, the distance from the center of this bar to the center of this bar is important. That distance, they have given us a name called gamma h. Well, we can calculate what gamma h is. It's to the center of that 25m bar. So we know that gamma h equals 350 minus our 30 millimeters times 2, minus our 10 millimeters times 2, and then half of this 25 M bar and half of that 25 M bar. And that will give us that dimension right there. Let's plug that in. We have 350 minus 30 times 2 minus 10 times 2 minus 25 divided by 2 times 2, we get a gamma H of 245 millimeters. Now, the tables that we look at, they liked us to have uh, to know what gamma was. So, gamma. Um, hold on just a second. Sorry about that, I got distracted there. So this is gamma H. It is some proportion of H. That's the value of gamma. Well, if that is uh, the full dimension of 350, what percentage of 350 is this? Well, gamma, gamma is equal to gamma H divided by H, or our 245 millimeters divided by our 350 millimeters. 245 divided by 350 is 0 0.7, or 70%. So basically we're saying that this zone in here is doing a big chunk of our work because stuff out here is either taken up by steel space or um, 
uh, cover, and the ratio of what we get to use is 70%. We know that knowing the gross area is going to be helpful for us. Let's just go back to these types of slides here. We know, so we know that we can look up what our F prime C is. There's B, there's gamma H. Well, look at this one. This one happens to be 70%, and there's Fy, equal reinforcements on all four sides. So this seems like a really good table for us to be using. We need to know where we are on this side and where we are on this side so we can start to draw some lines. Well, this is PR divided by AG, and this is MR divided by AGH. So we're going to want to know AG and AGH. AG is the gross area, or 350 by 350. or 122,500 millimeters squared. And then we want to know PR, AG, and MR, AGH. Well, we want a PR that is at least as strong as PF. So we know that we need PR to be at least 2,000 kilonewtons. But wait, we're about to deal in area, which is in millimeters. Maybe we should transfer this into, kilo, into newtons. So times 1,000 divided by our gross area. And we need an MR of at least 150 kilonewton meters, so maybe that's a really good one for us to use. We're going to be dealing with things in millimeters, so we should make sure we change our MF or our MR to, kilo, to newton millimeters instead. So 150 times 10 to the 6 divided by our gross area. times h. Let's calculate both of those. So our PR over AG is 2,000 times 1,000 divided by 122,500 and we get 16.33 and MR divided by AGH is 150 times 10 to the 6 divided by 122,500 divided by 350 gives us, oh, I plugged some, I did, sorry, plugged something in wrong there. All right, 150 times 10 to the 6 divided by 122,500 divided by 350, and we get 3.5. We know that with those two things, we can go look at a wonderful interaction diagram that will tell us what ratio of steel we need to make something work for this. So this is going to tell us what percentage of steel we need in this thing. Well, MRAGH of 3.5, that looks like we need a line right here, and PRAG of 16.3, well, there's 15, 16, 16.3, and we would have something meet right here. Let's take a look. I have this drawn right here. So here's our 3.5. Here's our 16.3. And we want to know where on these lines we are. Well, look, we actually land smack dab on one. And this reinforcing ratio is rho equals 0 0.04, or we need 4% reinforcement. If we had landed in between these lines, so say we had landed right here, if this is 
um, a reinforcement of 3%, and that's a reinforcement of 4%, and we had landed right here, well, we'd be using 3.5% as our reinforcement ratio. So we happen to land right on this line, which works handily for us. So we need 0 0.04. So that gave us 0 equals 0 0.04. Zero 0.04. So we have something now that we can use, but remember, rho is our ratio of steel to gross area. So that's our area of steel, and that's our gross area. Well, they just gave us what rho is. We can work backwards and figure out what area of steel we need. So AS is going to equal rho AG. So the area of steel we need is 0 0.04 times our gross area, or 122,500. So we need 0 0.04 times 122,500. Gives us 4,900 millimeters squared. So our column to meet those loads, because we worked with a transformed section where we talked about the ratio of steel as a ratio of the gross area, we have figured out that for this to work, we need an area of steel that is 4,900 millimeters squared. Now they told us to use 25 M bars, but we guessed at which bars we were going to use there. Let's just go through a little exercise here. So here is the 4,900 millimeters square uh, we need. Let's just take a look how many bars we need for each of the different diameters. So if we were using 10 M bars that each have an, an area of 100 millimeters, we would need 49 bars. So in this 350 by 350, we would need 49 10 M bars. 10 M bars are actually really flimsy. We don't like to use them for anything other than uh, crack control or as ties. 15 M bars have a cross-sectional area of 200, so we need 25 bars. I can tell you from experience that that's a lot of bars. Uh, 20 M bars, we'd need 17. 25 M bars, we'd need 10. All the way up to 55, where we'd only need three. Now I've told you that 45, 55, 45, and 35 are really big. We like to work with the 15, 20 to 25 range. Um, it looks like 25 with 10 or 10, 25 M bars would work really nicely. Now they explicitly told us to use 25 M bars, but in a normal problem, we would take a guess and start with 25, do this calculation and then see if 25 was the right choice. If this just was, too, was um, not that many bars, maybe we'd say, well, maybe 20 M bars would be better. But I'd have a pretty good guess of where I was starting. And I'd go back and redo this calculation because using a 20 M bar, that would change our gamma distance um, or our gamma H distance. If we've changed our gamma H distance, we change our uh, gamma value, and our gamma value um, is important for which table we're using. So if we went and changed what that diameter was of these bars, we would be looking at a different table. And sometimes we do that. Sometimes we go through this a few times. Now, they told us we need an equal number on each face. 10 M bars doesn't give us equal amount of bars on each face we would need 12 to have an equal amount of bars on each face. That would give us four bars on each face. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So for this column to work, a 350 by 350 reinforced uh, concrete column that had 
a PF of 2,000 kilonewtons and an MF of 150 kilonewtons with 300 MPa strength, we would want 12 25 M bars. So what about buckling? When we talked about our steel columns, oh, I'm hot now. Uh, it's also St. Patrick's Day, people. I'm from Nova Scotia. This is killing me that I can't go out tonight and truly live it up and listen to an Irish band and dance and jig and do my St. Patrick's Day stuff. Instead, I will make shepherd's pie with Guinness for my two-year-old and four-year-old. Okay, so slenderness. With our steel columns and our wood columns, we worried about that. We worried about it buckling. We knew that we could do something to stop it from buckling. Um, and if it was short enough relative to its cross-sectional area, so that if our bottom was here, it didn't get governed by buckling. It was just pure strength. Columns for concrete are a little bit interesting because they're so stocky. We need so much cross-sectional area just for the strength part that they tend not to be governed by buckling. But we have to check, usually. Um, if we have shear walls acting as a lateral load resisting system, 90% of concrete columns really just get to ignore slenderness. They're just, it's just not a problem. Uh, now there's a check to do for it. Um, we're not going to really get into it, um, but look, here's that KL over R uh, factor. So remember K was what the shape looks like of how it bends. This would be one, this would be 0.65. So it ends up that we assume it's acting like we have a shorter column than we do if it's moment connected at the ends. Concrete columns are moment connected at the ends, so we get to use a lower KL or a lower L value. Now, depending on how connected it is at the ends depends on the ratio of those moments. Um, so we have a smaller end moment, a larger end moment, we have our unbraced length, and if that ratio here is less than KL over R, we don't even need, or bigger than that, we don't even need to worry about slenderness. It just means it needed to be so big for strength, there's no way buckling is going to be a problem for our column. That seems a bit much because you guys don't know how to calculate what those moments are at the end. So here's a quick way to think about it. For columns without end moments, this results in a height to thickness ratio of about 10 for regular columns and 8.5 for round columns, for rectangular or 8.5 for round columns. Slender columns are designed using the same procedure as stocky columns, but we have we take those moments that at the end and increase them. We apply factors to increase those moments. Um, we're not going to worry about this. I'm not going to give you columns where uh, where slenderness would govern. Now that I took this off, I'm hot, or now I'm cold. So we are not going to worry about slenderness, but I wanted you to know that it's there. If you had tall columns with not heavy loads on it, you could end up with buckling being a problem, but it is very rare for columns in concrete. So let's move on to talking about concrete in bending. So we have a concrete beam in bending. We know the top typically is what's in compression and the bottom is in tension. So here is the cross section of a beam. So if we cut through here, we're looking at the inside of the beam. So cover is our fryer protection. That comes from the code. That is the distance from the edge to our element here. Most of the time we're worried about down here at the bottom. So the bottom of our beam right to the outside face of our tie beams. The bottom steel is our tension bar. So down here, this steel is doing all the tension work. Um, we have some top steel up here. Most of the time, this isn't doing much for us and its only job is to hold these ties. The ties 
are our shear reinforcing. So those legs are going to be used in our shear calculation, which we're going to do last. If we have reverse bending in our beam, where it's bending in this direction, where this is compression and this is tension, these top beams, these top pieces of steel actually become important. Um, and then we would call that AS prime to talk, just to indicate that we're talking about the top steel. But we're just going to be worrying about normal, uh, regular bending for us. Stirrups are these ties, um, and that we use for, for shear calculations and for shrinkage cracks. So look at this. For everything else, we called this dimension here D. We're going to call it H. Because remember, concrete cracks and it is effectively zero in tension. So when we bend it like this, this bottom concrete cracks until we hit our steel. And so we say D is actually the middle line of our steel here. So D isn't down here to the bottom of our beam, that's H. And this is our effective depth or to the, from the top of our beam to the center of our working steel. So that's lined up with the center of this. So that point there is dependent on the diameter of this, the diameter of our ties, and how much cover we have. So for a concrete beam and bending, I've said this, The top part is doing all of the work for the compression zone. So concrete does all the work there. The tension zone, the steel does all the work. So do you remember when we were doing our steel? We had stress diagrams that looked like that. And that was the maximum stress we wanted to see. Well, you can imagine it's a little bit different with our concrete. We've got some zone that can see compressive stress and some area that can see tensile stress down here. Now let's talk about how much reinforcing we put in these things. There are three terms or three ways we can reinforce concrete beams. We can make them balanced, we can have them over-reinforced, and we can have them under-reinforced. Oh, under-reinforced sounds like a bad thing, but under-reinforced is exactly what we want. We're not talking about, is it strong enough? We're talking about its ratio relative to the concrete. So a balanced reinforced beam, the rebar yield is reached at the exact same time the concrete reaches F prime C. It gives us no leeway. Over reinforced, the concrete will hit F prime C before the steel yields. Well, if F prime C gets hit before the steel yields, our concrete is our failure mode and concrete is brittle. We don't like brittle things. This one, it's just a hair perfect. It's just going to fail at the same time, which means still just as we yield, our F prime C is going to get hit and we're going to have brittle failure. We like to under reinforce just a little bit. We want to make as good use of things as we possibly can, but we want to slightly under reinforce our steel. And here's why. The steel is going to then yield because it hits its FY before the concrete hits F prime C. The steel will continue to deform without a change in stress or will have plastic behavior until the concrete finally hits its maximum stress. This results in ductile behavior because that steel yielding is ductility. We like ductility. It absorbs energy. It allows us to visibly see failure long before it happens. So that is our objective for our reinforcing. We want under reinforced concrete beams. So I've just underlined it. That's good. That's what we want. We want it to be under reinforced. So concrete and bending. 
The concrete in the tension zone cracks, so the concrete on the tension side of the neutral axis is neglected. That's that bit at the bottom where the cover is. It's just gone. We don't even count. It's practically like it's not there. The beam will be under reinforced, so the reinforcing steel and the concrete will both hit their maximum stresses. So we'll make full use of Fy of steel and we'll make full use of F prime C of the concrete. The parabolic stress profile in concrete can be approximated by a rectangular one. So I'm going to show you what that stress block looks like in the concrete. And we're going to make it, or we're going to pretend it's rectangle. And we'll apply some factors to it that allows us to pretend it's rectangle. So here is our diagram. We have the top part in compression. We have the bottom part in tension. There's our reinforcing steel. There's end steel, or we've taken our steel and we've transformed it into an equivalent area of concrete. So we've said this is, let's pretend that steel is concrete, what we did in last week's lecture, and we've transformed the steel to concrete using our N ratio, and this is what it would look like. We essentially only have tension in this one little spot. It's almost like a line. So we could represent it as an area. The concrete is going to have a tri triangular stress distribution because we're going to hit the maximum stress at the extreme fiber, the same way we did with our steel and our wood. This stress block, as we start to yield higher and higher and higher, as we start to um, hit that maximum stress, not yield because it's brittle, here's where it's before we've hit the maximum and we're getting closer and here we've hit F prime C. So here's our maximum stress right here. This is what the stress profile looks like. We're going to take this and approximate it as a rectangle because it's a lot easier to calculate the area of a rectangle. So we'll approximate this as a rectangle and put some factors on it. So here is the idealized stress block profile of an under-reinforced concrete beam. We have our zone that's taking the compressive force, and we have the area of our steel that's taking the, the tensile force. We can represent that as a T, or an arrow for force for T. T, we know, is a force, which means it is equal to stress times area. Well, we know that it's reinforcing steel, so we would need to apply our reduction factor for steel. We know we can calculate the area of steel, and we know what Fy is of reinforcing steel. It's 400. So we can figure out what this is. This is our idealized stress profile for the concrete. What we've done is said, okay, well, there's some funny things here. We're going to use this beta 1 that lets us kind of figure out how we're going to pretend it's actually a rectangle. We have alpha 1, our reduction factor for C for concrete, and our maximum stress for concrete. So if this was, you know, uh, uh, 30 MPa concrete, that would be 30 MPa. And when we hit that here, that's the maximum we want to see. We can represent this block here as the compressive capacity, or the compressive load of the concrete. And we can represent it as an arrow, and that arrow would be at the middle of this stress block, or halfway in this dimension, which is beta 1c. T, we know, happens right through the center of our steel area. Well, our steel area, the center of our steel area, is our cover, our rebar tie, and then half of our diameter is how far away this is. So we can start to figure out the values of these. I've written, rewritten them here as um, equations. The area of the concrete here, remember we have B into the page. We're looking at a stress block cut right through here, but we know we have the width B. So into the page here, We have that dimension B. So the area of this would be 
B into the page times B1C. Uh, so CC is our area of our concrete times this dimension here, which is alpha, our reduction factor for concrete, times the maximum strength of our concrete. So we can figure out what these two values are. Do you remember when we did our steel one? We figured out what that arrow was and what that arrow was, and we needed to know that distance between them. Well, we can figure that out, and that distance, those two things a distance apart is a couple, and remember we can rewrite a distance of an arrow from a, a neutral axis um, as a moment. Well, our moment resistance is um, how far away these are from the neutral axis, or T times uh, our D, which is this dimension, um, which we can calculate right here. Now, I know, that was a lot and kind of annoying. And I said a lot of things and you're sitting there going, shut up, Shannon, that was the worst. I get it. There's a lot here in these equations. Some of them are things you don't really need to know. What you need to know is that this is what the stress block profile of an under-reinforced concrete beam is, and that I have given you some of these values, and that B goes into the page. These are the equations we're going to make use of, and now we're going to actually figure out the moment resistance of a concrete beam. So again, the best way to take a look at these ones, I think, is with an example, because we'll actually be able to go through these steps of calculating these things. So let's take a look at the moment capacity of a 400 by 600 concrete beam with four 20M bars at the bottom, 10M ties at 300 center to center with 40 millimeters of cover and 300 MPA F prime C. Now, Maybe we took a guess at this dimension, 400 by 600, by using our size and guidelines. We said, okay, our size and guidelines say it should be around this size. Seems like a good place to start. Um, uh, we don't know what our actual reinforcing needs to be down here, but let's start with four 20M bars and see what we get. We would know what our MF is and we could compare it. If we didn't get a big enough MR, maybe we'd need to go back and reevaluate this. Uh, 10M ties is pretty normal. The 300 will come to when we talk about shear. The cover is about fire rating, which we would look up somewhere. And F prime C, we would figure out because beams are typically 300 MPA concrete. That's what we would tell them to make the concrete beam out of. So the, really the only thing that is um, unknowns here are these four 20M bars at the bottom. And we're taking a wild guess here and we're going to use that to calculate MR and to see if MR was greater than the MF. Now, they haven't given us MF, they've just asked us to calculate MR. So the very first thing we can calculate here is actually pretty easy. They've given us, or we're starting with an assumption of what bars we need. Now, we would normally be carrying, comparing this to a, uh, an MF. But we're just going to figure out what the moment capacity of this beam is. Um, so we know that the we know that T equals the reduction factor uh, for reinforced concrete steel or rebar AS. Fy. So we can right away figure out what the tensile capacity of that concrete beam is. We know that the reduction factor is 0 0.85. We can figure out the area of the steel. We had four 20M bars, and 20M bars have an area of 300 millimeters squared. And then Fy for rebar is 400. T equals 0.85 times 4 times 300 times 400. That equals 408 
thousand newtons. Remember, we like to talk about things in kilonewtons normally. So 408 kilonewtons. We know that the dimensions on that stress block is beta 1 C. You don't really understand why or how that came about, but it's some redrawing of making a, a funny little oval shaped or elliptical shape or some funny shaped stress block look more rectangular. But we've been given that beta 1 C is T divided by alpha 1, the reduction factor for concrete, F prime C, which is the maximum strength we want our co concrete to see, times B, or divided by B. Well, we figured most of this out, or we know most of this. T, we figured out, is uh, 408,000. Alpha 1, I've told you, is 0.8. The reduction factor for concrete is 0 0.65. The question told us that we're using an F prime C of 30, and we know that B was 400. That was how wide our concrete beam is. So we can calculate beta 1C. 408,000 divided by 0 0.8, divided by 0 0.65, divided by 30, divided by 400, gives us 63.38. So that's that dimension of stress block that we have that is our compression zone. So if you remember, we have a stress block that looks like this and an arrow here. That's this dimension right here that we've just calculated. That means, and we also can now calculate what D is. So D is the depth is from the top of our beam right down to the center of our reinforced concrete beam. D is our total depth, 600, minus our 40 for cover, minus our 10 millimeters for our ties, minus our 20 M bars divided by 2, because we want right to the center of those bars. So D we can calculate is 600, minus 40, minus 10, minus 20 divided by 2, or 540 millimeters. MR is about the couple between these two things. So MR equals T times D minus our stress block 1, C, divided by 2. Or basically, that dimension there. That is what this calculation is, times our uh, T value. So MR, we can calculate, is 408,000 times D, which is 540, minus our stress block, uh, which is beta 1C, where we calculated as 63.38, divided by 2. 408,000 times 540 minus 63.38 divided by 2. Well, that's a really, really big number, but we know that that is in uh, Newton millimeters. It was 207 times 10 to the 6 Newton millimeters. We like things to be in kilonewton meters, so this is the same as 207 kilonewton meters. So the MR for this beam So the MR for this beam is 207 kilonewton meters. If we knew that we had an MF of 200 kilonewton meters on this, we'd be able to say that MR is greater than MF and we would have a beam that works. 
If we had an MF of 210 kilonewton meters, we'd be like, oh, farts, this doesn't work, but we're pretty darn close. Maybe we should go back and try this. Maybe we should try five uh, 20 M bars. Maybe we should try four 25 M bars. Maybe one of those things would be better. Remember, if we change to 25 M bars, our D value changes because this is a bigger diameter, and now our D is up just a little bit higher. So sometimes it takes several iterations to get the right answer. So here that is worked out for you again. Okay, so what are some other things that you should know about reinforced concrete beams? Well, a slab is essentially just a wide, flat beam. We do the exact same thing for designing our slabs that we do for a beam, except our, um, our depth is much shallower, and we'll say, okay, let's take a, uh, we'll actually call them um, um, slab strips, or maybe we'll take a meter at a time and analyze it as a beam that looks like And maybe that's one meter, for example. Uh, concrete beams aren't always rectangular. We can have T-shaped beams uh, and use the slab in compression. So if we have If we have a, a T-beam, if we have a, a reinforced concrete beam that's cast up into the slab, which I've told you is super duper common, we will sometimes say that that is actually the shape of our concrete beam. And now that stress block profile, oops, doing that for the pain. Now that stress rock profile, B, just got a whole lot bigger. Um, uh, if we ensure that the beam is under reinforced for basic premise holds true. So that's what we try to do. To do that, we limit the depth of the compression block to a specified maximum. You don't have to worry about that. Um, we can increase the bending resistance by adding reinforcement in the compression zone. So we can actually have, oh. Sorry guys. Um, we can make use of steel up here sometimes in the compression zone. We can also have reverse bending where we would need steel in the top as well. So that was bending. So an, a beam in bending has moment and shear. So we need to worry about shear as well. So what this is just looking at um, another beam or the same beam essentially. Let's take a look at what shear does in concrete. Um, well, I'll show you what works for what part at least. So if this is our concrete beam, we get to use the whole cross-sectional area. Remember for a W section, we use the web of the steel and for a wood beam, we use the entire cross-sectional area we get to use the entire cross-sectional area of concrete. Uh, and that's fantastic, except that we do know that concrete cracks, and so we'll often have ties in there as well. We can get sometimes the concrete to work for us and be the entire shear resistance we need, but sometimes it's not enough, and we can make use of those ties. Now, what we're saying is that we have a series of steel along the face of this element. And you're thinking, well, if shear is about two things slipping past each other, 
this way, how does putting steel going this way help us in any way, shape, or form? So I'll show you how that works. So our shear capacity makes use of the area of the concrete and also the cross-sectional area of our ties. So do you remember when we were talking about shear? As much as I said it's two planes slipping past each other, we have an infinite amount of those planes slipping past each other. And if we are talking about a plane over here and a plane over here, and we're slipping past, we start to get this skewed shape or something that looks like this, which is similar to that diamond being squashed, or I guess for you, squashed in this direction and stretched in that direction. So it's like we have tension pulling across there. Concrete doesn't like tension. Concrete cracks under tension. So we'll get cracks on the diagonal. So that's why we like reinforcing in this direction because we're going to get cracks that go in this direction. And we want it to hit this steel and stop. So here's what it looks like. As we get bending, we get cracks that form like this. So this is sheer cracking happening in a concrete beam. Look, it hits this steel stirrup and stops because the steel does the work there. So there's two methods to do these calculations. There's the simplified method and then the modified compression field method. You guys are all gonna have to be experts on the modified compression field theory. I'm joking, no you're not. We're just gonna do the simplified method. The simplified method works the majority of the time and definitely what we're going to do within this course. It essentially treats it like it's a truss. We have um, uh, compression and tension uh, webs acting throughout our beam. It's a very simple, simple calculation. The capacity, the shear capacity of our reinforced concrete beam is the shear capacity of the concrete plus the shear capacity of the steel, similar to our concrete columns. The shear capacity of the concrete, we have our, um, our capacity of concrete, we have our width and our depth, so D. We're not using the bottom because we're assuming that's been fully destroyed due to bending. So we have B times D, which is a shape property, times our strength, times a reduction factor. Now, with concrete, we're not quite sure how much is cracking and what's happening. We take a very, very low amount of it as the concrete capacity. We take 0.2 times the square root of this portion of our equation. So we actually take a fraction of what we would for steel or wood. The shear of the steel is our uh, reduction factor, the cross-sectional area of our steel reinforcing, so that's the area of our ties, times the strength of the steel, and then we have D divided by S. This is really just saying that over a particular length of our beam, we have so many of those stirrups that we're going to try to cross. So we have um, a depth, and we have um, over that depth, how many strips are we going to cross over a particular length? So that lets us, um, uh, you know, use this, if we put them closer together, um, uh, over that depth of the beam, we're going to be more likely to cross bars of steel as it tries to crack. So increasing the spacing means we're less likely to get those, or we're gonna have more steel get hit as it tries to crack, which means we get more steel area that we're making use of. Now, lambda is M for normal concrete. Don't worry about that. Uh, BW is the minimum effective web width within the depth D. For us, that is just B. So normal cross-sectional area, except that we're using D. 
AV is the cross-sectional area of reinforcing steel crossing the tension plane, or our stirrups. Note that a typical stirrup has two legs. Remember, our stirrup looks like this. So we're crossing here, and we're crossing there. So we have two legs of our stirrup. So that AV equals the cross-sectional area of whatever that bar is, but times two, because we have two legs. And then S is the spacing of the stirrups. So let's take that exact same beam that we just did for a moment and figure out what the shear capacity of this beam is. So let's figure out what the shear capacity of that same reinforced concrete beam is. We know that two parts of that beam can do the shear work for us. We don't know what the actual shear value is on this, but we can calculate the shear capacity. We want to know what VR equals. We know that VR for concrete has two parts. For a reinforced concrete beam, it has two parts. It has the steel component and the concrete component. So if we can calculate both of those, we can calculate what the total shear resistance of this is. We've been told that VC is a modification of the normal VC we do, which is a shape property that is area times, times the reduction, reduction factor times the strength of the material. Well, they've added in a few factors for us, and we know that the, the equation is 0.2 times lambda, the reduction factor for concrete, times the square root of F prime C, oh sorry, B, D. Lambda, I've told you, is going to be uh, 1. We know that the reduction factor for concrete is 0.65. We know that we're using concrete that is 30 MPa. We know the width of the beam. Uh, and we know the effective depth of the beam. We calculated that as this value right here. That's D. So we can calculate the shear capacity of the concrete. It's 0.2 times 1 times 0 0.65 times the square root of 30 times 400 times 540. 0.2 times 1 times 0.65 times the square root of 30 times 400 times 540. And we get 153,800 newtons or 153.8 kilonewtons. If we had known what VF is on this, maybe VF was only 100 kilonewtons, we probably wouldn't even go any further. We wouldn't even check to see if that, um, that steel that we would put in anyway for crack control also is needed if, if we wouldn't even bother to check its ability to help us for shear reinforcing. But we don't know what VF is on this, and they've asked us to find what the total shear capacity of this is. Well, VS is our reduction factor for steel times our area for our steel times our maximum stress for our steel reinforcing. And then we have D divided by S. D is the depth and S is the spacing, which is basically trying to give us how many times we're going to cross um, that those steel stirrups um, as we send a crack up the, the depth of the beam. Our reduction factor for reinforcing steel is 0.85. The area of the steel 
is 100 millimeters for each leg of our rebar. Remember our ties are 10M bars, which means they have 100 millimeters. We have that table that shows us that. But we have two legs. Our FY is 400. Our D is 540, and they told us that the spacing of these bars was every 200 millimeters. They told us we have these stirrups at 200 millimeters. So 0.85 times 2 times 100 times 400 times 540 divided by 200 we get 183,600 newtons, which is the same as 183.6 kilonewtons. VR, or the total shear capacity of this beam, is 153.8 plus 183.6. So 153.8 plus 180. 3.6 and we get 337.4 kilonewtons. So we would now be able to compare that to the actual shear on this beam so that we could calculate if this concrete beam worked. Next week I'll do some calculations where we actually are given um, MF and VF, and we can compare it and see if our members work. And maybe we might need to do an iteration and go back and redo it. So there's one last funny little thing about um, concrete that I want to talk about, especially with these. We've talked about how for the columns, they're essentially moment connected. They are often moment connected at the top and bottom just by the fact that they're cast together. Well, in our steel, we have a series of elements on um, column supports, and we have pinned connections at the end, and we're just given that. That's just the easy way to detail things. For our concrete beams, they tend to be continuous across the tops of our columns, and we'll actually cast down into columns. So they're continuous with each other because they're not discrete pieces of steel that we're just pinning together. We're casting these long pieces of rebar into our beams. So if we have beams with multiple bays, we will often have continuous beams or moment connected across its length. So I didn't in this even assume that there was a moment connection into the column. These beams just aren't pinned at the end. They're continuous through themselves. This is two, these are the same length of grids um, with the same load along them. So they have the same UDL. If we have a series of simply supported beams, which is what we would have in steel, because that's the very easy way to detail it, we would have a maximum moment of 45 kilonewton meters. So we would put our rebar at the bottom if we were making these into concrete beams. If we just cast it all together, we would have to go out of our way to stop our reinforcing at these points and do serious things to make that happen. And we can do that. But the easy, natural way to cast concrete is to just make the rebar continuous, which would give us a continuous beam. If we took the same loading conditions, we would have a maximum moment up here of 32 and a maximum moment down here of 19. That is less than our maximum moment of 45. But look, now we have at the middle of the beam bending like this, but over the supports, we have bending like this. So for this set of beams, we would need to make sure we have reinforcing top and bottom. So we would stop and look at the problem twice. We would figure out what reinforcing we need on the bottom to handle this moment, and then we would figure out what reinforcing we need on top when we have our reverse bending to handle this moment. And that is a very, very common way to actually detail concrete systems. So anything I'm going to give you is going to be very simplified. 
but it can get much more complicated with concrete um, and we can actually make that work to our advantage. We can take some, some advantage of some things in concrete that we don't get to in the other materials because they're coming in as discrete pieces and moment connections are really hard to do in the field. Concrete, we're casting as one big um, kind of uniform system so we can get con moment connections somewhat easier. We just have to make sure we put the reinforcing in there so that the, the concrete beam can handle it. So what are the things we need to know? You should know what the basic look of a concrete slab, concrete beam, and a concrete column is. You should be able to look at it and say, oh yeah, I know what that is. You should know that concrete columns use the steel and the concrete to take compression. You should know that for concrete beams, the concrete is used for compression and shear, and that the steel is used for tension, um, and maybe top tension and shear. Um, you should know uh, that the, what the idealized stress lock looks like for a concrete beam makes lovely exam questions. You should know how to calculate the reinforcement required for a concrete column. You should know how to calculate MR for an under-reinforced beam. And you should know how to calculate VR for a uh, concrete beam. You should know what the general moment diagram of a continuous beam looks like too. But all of those things we talked about in this lecture. I know that for this lecture, there's a lot of things that I told you that I said, mm, you don't have to worry about it. Um, I'm not trying to dumb it down for you. I know some people think that um, uh, I should spend the time to talk about that. The reason I do it this way is because getting into the in-depth calculations is not twice the work, but ten times the work. I want you to hear the terms and have them at least sound familiar, but I want to give you the examples that are a little bit easier to calculate so that we're not trying to overwhelm ourselves with the really complex calculations. I want you to be able to handle the simple calculations, but I want you to understand that things can be more complicated and hear the terms for what those could be. So that's why I've broken it down this way. So next week, I'm going to go through and do um, full calculations for uh, steel column and beam, wood column and beam, and concrete column and beam. And that will probably be the full lecture next week, so you probably won't even see my face. It'll all just be calculations that you can practice with, so maybe that's handy for you. Um, and then the next week after that, we're going to be doing beam testing, and then the last week is going to be a fun lecture. <laughs>